Well, for those of you not watching on our YouTube channel, uh, lucky you, because you're missing my very best golf shirt. It's the best one I've got to look the part. I don't golf at all, but I went out to support a golf tournament in Kitchener today in support of Kids Ability Foundation. Great work being done in our community by Kids Ability. Kudos to the organizers. Just wanted to give them a shout out as we welcome you to another pop-up summer episode of the OHL podcast. I'm Mike Farwell. Dan Mahar, how's your golf game, buddy? Come on. Golf game's terrible, but shirt game's okay. I'm just going to, for those that are watching, I got my uh, Hockey Canada shirt on for in honor of the Halinka, which we'll talk about, but the golf game is terrible. So We will get to the Halinka for sure. It's really the primary motivation for having this pop-up episode, but a few more things have happened as well. Let's go back for a second, though. I've known you for a long time. I'm not sure I've ever known your golf game to be that terrible you're just being hard on yourself you're being modest come on uh, <laughs> frustrating I'll, I'll use the word frustrating as opposed to terrible i think the last round i played was the most bizarre round i've ever played where my, off the tee uh, i looked like a pro around the green i looked like a six-year-old learning the game it was just the most bizarre outing i've ever had where you know uh, par fours off the green 20 yards off the green in one and end up taking fives and sixes so it was, it was a little embarrassing and and we'll, we'll use the word frustrating more than terrible isn't that the game though? Eh? You get a good shot here or there or you're strong off the tee. You're like, I can play this game. I'll just go back out again and again and again, just to get more frustrated. Oh, it is completely frustrating, especially with someone like me who makes the hard shots look easy and easy shots look hard. I don't know what it is with me, but uh, <laughs> that's my game in a nutshell. Okay. Believe it or not, we have not changed this to a golf podcast. I'm sure there are mm-hmm. plenty of those that you've been enjoying over the years, but we are going to focus on the Ontario Hockey League as of this date, 49 days until the regular season opens. We are, this episode being released on Friday, August the 11th. So I'll tell you what, 49 days till opening day. Training camps will open a couple of weeks from now, later this month. We are basically into a new season. And Dan Mahar, as the Kitchener Rangers come into the new season, On our last pop-up episode, we already got to talk about the new head coach that's been added. You see a hocus coming over from Finland. And now we have just learned that Jeff Kurzakis, late of the Mississauga Steelheads, where he was a coach and assistant general manager, comes over to hold the same role with the Kitchener Rangers. So see a coach, assistant general manager. What do you think? Uh, it's an interesting process, right? Because I think when when you hire a coach from Finland, the one thing a lot of people don't think of is some of these guys like to bring in their people. But when your people are across the pond, it's not so easy. So he presumably had a long, engaging process to figure out who he wanted on the bench with him this year. And I'm sure there were a number of names that he spoke with. And and to settle on, on Jeff Krasakas, I mean... I don't know the ins and outs of everything he's been involved in with the Mississauga Steelheads over the last seven years, but with that assistant GM title on his tag, I can imagine he was heavily involved in a lot of the moves they made. And as you know, Mike, I've been a big fan of the way the Mississauga Steelheads have handled their business of late. So it it feels to me like a win for the Kitchener Rangers. Yeah, and the Steelheads have had some success recently. Some thought maybe they missed a step when they should have been better in the cycle than they were, but I'm with you. I think some really shrewd moves made, and it's not lost on me a couple of things. First is that the Kitchener Rangers and Mississauga Steelheads have, in recent years, been very active trading partners back and forth with one another. So clearly there's a familiarity with Kurzakis and his work from Mississauga. And the other piece that strikes me in this, I'm not trying to start any sort of wild conspiracy here, But if you are going to bring the guy in as an assistant general manager, maybe just maybe there is some succession planning going on here on the part of the Kitchener Rangers, which to me just makes good business sense. I'm not saying, again, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that Mike McKenzie is bound for another league, another level, another job anytime soon. But I think we all know that Mike McKenzie has aspirations higher than the Ontario Hockey League at some point. So if you're bringing in a guy like Kurzakis now in the 23-24 season, and who knows, maybe it's a year, maybe it's five years, but all this time, perhaps Kurzakis, who spent seven years in Mississauga, gets comfortable here, gets familiar here, McKenzie moves up, and oh, look at that, in-house, a ready-made solution to what could be a potential problem. 
Well, you know, Mike, I know you branded it a wild theory, but actually that that's the exact thought that crossed my mind when I read the, his resume. I mean, everything about his resume lines up for it. Yeah, you know what? This looks like someone who might take over when other people in the organization move up. And we, you mentioned Mike McKenzie with aspirations for the NHL. Well, I would, I would say the same probably of UC Ahokas, who's made it clear that's his goal. Um, I know he has the two-year contract here, plus potential two after that. But with you've got two, two gentlemen at the head of that organization, both with aspirations of moving on, you hire someone with all this experience in both coaching and GM work at various levels. Um, so, and if I could just tag on to your theory too, about how much this, this hire makes sense from that standpoint, a, a succession planning standpoint, but also we've heard a lot about UC Hocus being a defensive minded structured coach. And I think one thing that Jeff Krasakis brings or brought as a player is a very good offensive mind. He brings that offensive thinking to the game as well. And, and for someone like a Hocus, I think any coach is wise to buffer themselves with things they're not strong at. I'm not saying a Hocus isn't strong at the offensive game, but his bread and butter has been defense and structure. So why not bring in someone like Krasakis who clearly brings the resume to the game to, to complement what he has? If you think that theory is even a little bit wild, you just wait until we get to our Halinka Gretzky Cup talk. I have got some tires to pump today, and it might surprise you the team whose tires I'm pumping. It might, but we'll get to that. I'm putting air in those tires right now. Manual pump. All right. One last piece just on the Kitchener Ranger side. Given this hire, you see a hocus who we've already talked about, but I think it would be fair to say, Dan, that we are really at the dawning of a new era of Kitchener Rangers hockey. It's been, and I'm not saying stale by any stretch, but it's there has been a similar culture look, if you will, to the team with threads connecting one era to another, arguably back as far as Steve Spot and, and Pete DeBoer. You know, Troy Smith comes along and his connections, you know, to Mike Van Ryan, to Jay McKee, the, these threads continued. It's looking like a brand new generation, let's say, behind the Kitchener Rangers bench as we approach the season. Yeah, you know, Mike, and I think it was probably necessary, and this isn't a shot at any of the, the former regimes, really, um, but I, I, a lot of terms kind of crossed our mind when we talked about the Kitchen Rangers the last several years, and they've had some success, had had a few good cores that they built and good runs, but I think terms like comfortable started to come in. Uh, I've even harsher term, I've heard the term country club thrown around in, in, amongst fan groups and some some members of the uh not local media but uh for me i think when those sort of sentiments start to set in you have a problem to address and i think that maybe a little bit of an overhaul is what they needed and there there can be a fine line between a, a calm professional organization and a little bit of a comfortable country club style organization so you need to have you walk that fine line of yeah, we're professional. We're not we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater here, but at the same time, we're our expectations are there. There's account accountability. And I think that's what a lot of people in Kitchener wanted to see. So a bit of an overhaul like this was probably uh, due at this time. All right. From here, let's go there. And I'm gonna do this like any good performance review, I think is supposed to be done. You start with a little bit of the constructive criticism and then you give them something nice to leave that performance review feeling okay about themselves. So let's start here. Should any of us be surprised that it's the Niagara Ice Dogs first out of the gates when the trade window, the trade freeze lifts and the window is open and boom, they go back to Windsor where <laughs> team they traded with a couple of times. Who didn't the Niagara Ice Dogs trade with? I, I believe we finished with your line. The Ice Dogs made more trades than they had wins on the season last year. Just a a, a remarkable flurry from the ice dogs front office. But I'll say this, I, I like Sobolev as a piece because he's got a bit of a nasty streak to him. I put him down as a guy that would log top pairing minutes for a young Niagara club. If he does report there, when you look at the exchange going back Windsor's way, a 15th rounder and then conditional fourths and eighths, uh, one of each. Okay, I guess we'll see. I suspect Sobolev will show up. The other thing that makes me a little curious is that it's an OA and an import in one player. You don't usually tie up both of those commodities, if you will, in one player. But generally speaking, 
all joking about another Niagara trade aside, I kind of like this deal for the Ice Dogs. Yeah, when you hit the nail on the head there a minute ago, when you talk about look at the way the deal's structured, obviously there's uncertainty about whether or not he'll he'll be coming. I think a couple of positive signs in Niagara's favor here are that uh, Sobolev, as we know, a fifth round pick of Montreal in the NHL, was not offered a contract. They're just absolutely loaded for prospects on D. So it was a tough go for him. Fell way way down the depth chart and just wasn't room for him. So you have a guy with something to prove. He's looking for another crack, another NHL team to take a shot on him. So obviously another year in the OHL would make some sense for him, especially in a leadership role, probably play top pairing minutes in, in Niagara. So there's all kinds of reasons to think this might come to fruition, but yeah, I, I really like Sobolev's defensive game. He's got a little bit of nastiness, great positioning, good stick. The thing with Sobolev has always been, can he move the puck and can he produce any offense? And Sometimes players take a big leap forward in their OA year, and I think that's what Niagara is probably hoping for here because I think everyone who's watched Sobolev play says there's more there than he's shown. So I'm just going to be honest about this. It's pretty easy to take shots at the Ice Dogs for obvious reasons. The performance on the ice, all of the things that we've documented, right? Darren Dodobler's uh, mm-hmm. lack of success with other uh, teams that he owned, including uh, Brantford and in, in Junior B. I mean, we could go on and on. Those shots have been taken. Those jokes have been made. And so I'm going to turn it into this positive. The Ice Dogs, upon appeal, have reacquired their first round pick for next year's draft in 2024. That was one of the sanctions levied against the team for one of the awful off ice messes that transpired last year amongst everything else. We get two players banned from the league essentially for the rest of their careers. They don't get to come back in Landon Cato and Josh Rosenzweig. Uh, we have Darren Dobler still can't act as the team's uh, general manager or right. That's what it is. He can't be there for a couple of years. Uh, they lose the, uh, they, they pay a fine. They, they lose the draft pick. They get the draft pick back. And I liked what the Dobbler said. Culture doesn't change overnight. We are committed to changing the culture here in St. Catharines. So he's had a year. It was a very strange, if not complicated, if not controversial year. But here's where I'm going to leave the conversation on the ice dogs. I'm taking him at his word. I absolutely believe he's right culture doesn't change overnight so the niagara watch is on double d as they call darren de dobler let's see if you are going to back up with action the words you have spoken culture doesn't change overnight let's begin watching the incremental change for the niagara ice dogs this season i'm on team ice dogs well there's not much more i can add to that mike i agree 100 percent i I believe in second chances, obviously, and giving people the benefit of the doubt till they blow it. And I think I do like what Darren Dobler did say in regards to his appeal to the the punishment. And he he's right. You know, you need some time. He acknowledged that there were cultural issues there that have to be fixed and saying, just give me a little time. It doesn't change overnight. So here you go. We, we You got your pick back. Now you're on the clock. Like you said, now is your time to prove that you meant what you said and, and you can bring some stability and normalcy to that environment. And as for the pick going back, I know it infuriated some people to go back on the punishment. I've, I've always had mixed feelings about the, the pick punishment anyway, because in a lot of ways, I feel like that punishes the, the other players on the team and punishes the fans where, you know, hit them in the pocketbook with the fines and whatnot. And I know you want to have some harsh punishments to avoid this stuff, but if you really want to fill those buildings and get the fans out there, it makes it tougher when you, when you hurt their ability to compete even more. So um, yeah, like you said, I can't add much more to what you said on that one, Mike. I'm glad you mentioned the fans, though, Dan, because, again, we talked about this during our last season of episodes, but I was there with the Kitchener Rangers late in the season. Things were well out of reach for the Niagara Ice Dogs, and they had a Saturday night crowd in that barn. That was one of the best crowds I had seen all year for a team that stood no chance of going anywhere, and they were just there to watch some hockey. It was a terrific atmosphere, and that's a credit to the fans. So, again, I am pulling for you, St. Catharines. Let's see some good news come out of that team this season for sure. All right, from fans there to, I think, fans in the Ontario Hockey League generally? Does it matter if any other game is played on Saturday, November the 4th, other than the game up in Sault Ste. Marie? Who's going to care about any game anywhere other than the game where Jumbo Joe's number 19 is retired in the Sioux? 
You know, it's it's an interesting point, Mike. You'd love to see for something like this if the league did just leave that night for for that event, I suppose, and for that person, just have the rest of the league's eyes looking on it, and it would really mean something to to the player and his family. And and yeah, Joe Thornton, what a remarkable career. I mean, you think of all the the uniforms he's worn over the years. A lot of people think of him as the Sioux Greyhound and the San Jose Shark. I mean, there was that blemish he had where he wore that other blue jersey for a little while that, that really reflected poorly on him. But but what a great career. And uh, yeah, a special night for him and the fans in the Sioux. And like you, I think everyone that's going to be working that night in the OHL would love to, to tune into that instead. I'm a big fan of Sault Ste. Marie for a number of reasons on and off the ice. I've really fallen in love with the community up there. I've made that clear over the years and episodes on this podcast, but Thornton himself as a player, one of those generational talents. And when you think about it, Thornton by his style, I mean, how can you not really compare him to another really big power forward that could have gone to the Sioux had he not snubbed them in, of course, Eric Lindros, but what a story. Imagine if Lindros had played up there, but either way, what a story it is of the players the Greyhounds have either had or in this case could have had. And Thornton, I think, just typifies that working person's mentality, that blue collar style that they love up there in the Sioux. He absolutely does, Mike. And just such an underrated player in terms of his vision and ability to make plays. You don't often think of big players like that as, as playmakers, but, but boy, was he ever a good playmaker. And, and also a case in point for those who, I don't know if people remember, uh, some of the older fans might, when Joe Thornton was just cracking into the NHL, there were a couple years early in his career where he was labeled a bust. People thought it was a terrible pick. And here we go to Hall of Famer. So it, it just the, the takeaway for me, the lessons learned from a career like Joe Thornton is do not judge these kids at 18, 19, 20 years old, because especially bigger bodies, they often take a few years. So, and Joe Thornton was a poster boy for that. So have a little patience with those guys. Great point. Okay. Dan insists he's been doing his research. Me, I've been putting air in the tires and getting ready for my wild theory. We still have to talk about the Halinka Gretzky cup and oh yeah, Back-to-back wins for Team Canada on this episode of the OHL podcast. Okay, Mr. Summer Homework doing his research. Here we are. The tournament has just finished. We were talking about the players going in that we liked. Michael Misa, who ended up leading all OHLers with eight points through the tourney. I was curious about Carter George. Porter Martone comes through looking pretty good. Malcolm Spence, those were some guys that I had identified coming into the tournament. Look, I think all of the OHLers accommodated themselves very well. Henry Muse was a guy you talked about. I'll stop. You've done the deep dive. I'll get to my theory in a minute. What are your takeaways from what we saw at the Halinka Gretzky Cup from Team Canada? Well, we knew going in, Mike, this was a special year for the OHL, particularly for defensemen. And I, and this is one of my favorite tournaments uh, of this season just because i always find there's there's always it's a coming out party for at least five or six kids every year people jump onto the radar and i think the first kid that jumped onto my radar that admittedly hadn't been high on my radar yet was cole bodwin of the barry colts what a tournament he had just trusted in every situation uh 200 foot player uh some special skill there too and i think that's a guy that you look at and look at the tournament he had and he's just gonna leap off the page this year um so a lot, lots from the OHL contingent this year. There's, and we can get into the players one by one in a bit, but just before uh, I let you get to your theory, I'll say huge takeaway for me. When I set my top tier of players from this tournament, from the OHL, there were a few names more than I expected, but three that I would put on that tier are, so you, you mentioned Michael Misa, you mentioned Porter Martone and of course, Malcolm Spence are, are, are three that were in my top tier of performers from that tournament. And is it a little ridiculous, Mike, if I mentioned to you that all three are not eligible for the NHL draft till 2025. <laughs> so you talk about what a draft that is shaping up to be where these kids are looking like top end picks for the next draft, but because of late birthdays, we don't get them till 2025. That is incredible. And you used the phrase coming out party a moment ago it's really going to be interesting then if indeed this was the coming out i mean we both liked spence and martone and misa it goes without saying but we both liked them during the regular season but if indeed and i'm talking the previous regular season of course if indeed this was another step forward that coming out party how much fun is it going to be to watch these jeff kersakis might want to go back to mississauga (laughs) with martone now i mean come on 
Uh, but it's it's going to be a lot of fun and great point on all of them. Al Latang, let's give a nod there as well. After a season in Sarnia where they were loaded for bear and just ran into who else but the London Knights, I mean, that's got to feel pretty good for a guy that I think has earned everything he has received in the coaching ranks so far. Yeah, yeah, great point. You know, Al Latang's all class, as you know, you've probably dealt with him a few times, and he's always been all class. And he's, I've heard the phrase that the OHL is a bit of a development league for coaches too, which sometimes doesn't sit well with everyone. I say, well, no, it's, it's charged a fair bit of money for tickets. We expect a little more professionalism, but coaches develop too. And Alan Latang is a guy who I think has gotten better and better as a coach year over year. And uh, for those that don't remember, again, dialing back to play, Alan Latang was a heck of a player too in the OHL. So often these guys just, they're sponges. They take in more and more and just and up their game year over year. So there's a great point, Mike. There's a guy to look out for in the OHL because I think his teams are going to be more and more dangerous every year he spends here. So back-to-back gold medals, as we mentioned, for Team Canada at the Halinka Gretzky Cup. Are there any other players, Dan, that jumped off the page to you during this year's tourney? Oh, for sure. Well, you mentioned Carter George. I think you talked about the coming out party. What a, He was not supposed to be the starter of this team and just wrestled it away and then was phenomenal the rest of the tournament. But I think we mentioned a few. Uh, there's, uh, there's the obvious ones uh, with Muse putting up some points, especially in the power play. Zane Parekh, of course, always dangerous. But I think I don't think any player jumped off the page more to me than Sam Dickinson. And you, we'd be remiss not to mention him because just – just so good in both ends. And I've heard a bunch of people struggling to come up with comparables for him. And I heard, ah, you know, is he Alex Petrangelo, but he's got a little more bite. So what is he? But when you start hearing the names people are using to compare Sam Dickinson to, you think, wow, look out. There's a, there's a guy who I think of the last rankings I saw was ranked somewhere around eighth in the draft uh, projected upcoming NHL draft. Well, I've, unless things go south, I don't think we're going to see him around at number eight based on what I'm seeing from him right now. I'm glad you mentioned Dickinson because, of course, he plays for the London Knights. And again, something else you and I have talked about, and it's well documented. Look out. It's a scary, scary London Knights team coming into the 23-24 season. What they did last year en route to the OHL final seemed to be well, frankly, ahead of schedule. So the next couple of years, looking pretty good in the Forest City. But I emphasize London because here's where I'm just finishing pumping those tires could it be is it possible that the midwest division team that gives the london knights the most significant run for their money this season plays at the harry lumley bayshore community center in owen sound carter george was a guy i was watching most closely at this tournament and you talked about it he wrestled away the starting job that he wasn't expected to have what i was curious about was whether or not the small sample size that we got in the OHL last season would translate. Remember, he was lights out when he played for the Owen Sound Attack, but he could only get those 10 games in. The kid wasn't even starting for his junior B team. And you're wondering how that could possibly be. Politics might play a role in that. But the Mm -hmm. bottom line is we had a very small sample size of Carter George last season. So what are we going to get in a tournament like this with the pressure that is applied in a tournament like that? Well, I think we saw what we got from Carter George. 31 saves on 33 shots against in the final as Canada wins it in overtime. I look at the Owen Sound attack as a team that probably underperformed or did not meet expectations a season ago. The three amigos, if you will, in Denny Gore, Servak Petrovsky, and Colby Barlow were still there doing Gore, Petrovsky, Barlow kind of things. But The supporting cast wasn't necessarily there. And I think that the attack missed their experience on defense in Parrot, uh, or pardon me, in Parrot, uh, in Wooly more than they maybe thought that they would. So give some kids back there a little more experience. And then there's no arguing at all that goaltending was a weak link for the attack last year. Well, all signs are now pointing to this being Carter's crease in Owen Sound. And maybe, just maybe, the attack are a force to be reckoned with. It's a little early. We're still 49 days away from the regular season, but I'm I'm starting to color the dark horse around the Bayshore this year. 
Yeah, it's a great point, Mike, because you look at that core and uh, goaltending means so much. And if Carter George can step in and do anything like what he's done in his short stint so far, absolutely. That's a, So I think you, you obviously ident- you identified the obvious uh, steps they have to take. So obviously the defense, um, we'll see who steps up on that core. Or do they add someone? little veteran presence there because if they feel they've got a shot and you mentioned the amigos up front and another guy that i i'm not saying he had a down year but i think was a massive supporting piece up front that feels he can do a lot more especially coming into his 19 year old year is cedric gendon i think that's a a more than point a game player when he's on so you start to look pretty dangerous up front you start to look very dangerous in net shore up that d a little bit and you absolutely have a dark horse and not a fun place to play, right? You get 34 games in the cozy confines of the Bay Shore, and that could mean a ton. You know, it occurs to me as we're, we're having this chat, and here we are in mid-August, plenty to talk about in the league. I don't know how this flies in your household, Dan. Every once in a while, I get the, I get the stink eye from the missus. She's like, seriously? I thought, I thought summer is a break from ho- hockey and podcasting, et cetera. Is there room, or is the conversation like, I think that ship has sailed, but I I still worry a little bit that there might be just a little bit too much hockey being played here. Like we haven't even, U17s will come up when the season starts, right? We got the world juniors, the U20s, all the, you know, so much hockey. I get it. I understand it's a 12 month thing now, but God, at some point, and I, maybe the ship has sailed, but I I think we might have to reevaluate how much pressure we're putting on, how much stress we're placing just physical bodies under by playing hockey as much as we play hockey in this country. Yeah. You know, Mike, and we're going to sound very old school here, but I've been, I've been on this train for a while because as a guy who grew up switching completely over to baseball in the summer, which is what all the old NHLers used to do, right? They used to shut down from hockey for at least two months, uh, probably more play slow pitch, play ball in the summer, Ryan, just turn your brain off hockey. And I think that there's actually some pretty good medical science that talks about how beneficial that is for you to switch, totally switch gears, totally switch sports, do something else. So I would advocate for some massive global peace accord, Mike, where we just say something like, you know, July is no hockey month. No one's on the ice, rink shut down, do something else, switch your brains off. I know there's so much competition for these jobs and for these opportunities that no player wants to be left behind and look lazy and, you know, take some time off and then find themselves behind another 30 players. So that's what's driving it as well as the economy of all these gyms and hockey schools that are going. So it, it's going to be, like you said, the ship has probably sailed. There's probably no turning back, but I, I, I love to have this opportunity to just say what you said. And, and there are massive benefits to shutting out from hockey for a while, 12 months, consistently is not good for anyone at anything would be my stance all right if that ship has sailed it's not going to stop us from making our feelings known on the issue so consider our feelings known and since we're on that let me take it one step further because i have decided so here's a little preview of the 23 24 ohl podcast season to come i'm getting on this high horse and it's i I gotta climb my step ladder to get on it but i'm getting on it and i'm not getting off shout out to the league for what they've been doing over the summer if you've seen it on the ohl's website giving you some behind the scenes looks at the people who are doing jobs that you never see you see the their work but you don't know who's behind them terrific work by the league to showcase and profile some of these talents that are working behind the scenes i've been keeping in touch with my colleagues on the media side and don't get me wrong this is all me but just in conversations the horse i'm i'm getting on to right now is the one that says i'm i'm going to appeal to the ontario hockey league because of the caliber of play and the games in the league and how seriously the league is taken by fans the people who cover it the scouts etc we need to start setting a bar of some sort when people come to visit an arena in the Ontario Hockey League. The media rooms, and I know this is completely selfish, but they have to have some sort of minimum standard that starts with a heart, a hot cup of coffee and goes from there. You got to be able to treat with some level of professionalism the people that are coming to cover your games, be they scouts, NHL general managers, radio schmucks like me, newspaper report, take your pick. Doesn't matter. 
I think there needs to be a bar. There needs to be a baseline here, and I'm going to implore the Ontario Hockey League to seriously consider establishing the bar. I'm happy to give you some pointers, a little bit of pizza, box of donuts, some hot coffee, and a good set of media notes. Pretty much all we need, and sadly, we can't get it in every rink. No, fair enough. I you feel free to stay up on that horse. I mean, I'm I'm happy to wear my Farwell needs donuts shirt <laughs> around the ranks. Um, but yeah, I know you're right. It, it is an ecosystem, right? The whole thing's an ecosystem, and it needs the various components to function properly. So understanding the role that the media plays, the role that the fans play, the role that and and you know when you do these things properly, like you're describing, Mike, you get more people in your rank, you get more fans, you get more uh, media attention, you get more scouts easier to recruit when you can tell the players and the families, Hey, we had X number of scouts attend our games this year. We get more eyes. So all those things, it is an ecosystem. And anytime anyone starts thinking they're a bigger piece of that ecosystem and someone else is smaller and they don't need them, it's a lose, lose situation for everyone. So yeah, it's, it may sound like a small point, but, uh, but I'm happy to have you on that horse. Uh, I'll give a little heads up to any of my friends in the scouting community or fellow media When you're coming to Kitchener, I have it on good authority because I've spoken with my friends Toby and Megan, who are the duo, the husband and wife team behind the Village Caterer. They're on for all 34 games at the Memorial Auditorium this season. We're going to be eating good in Kitchener, folks. So there you go. Great spread every night. Yes, it's all about the food. All right. uh, Before you get sick of us in the summer, I think we've covered all our bases here, Dan. No pun intended because we were just talking about slow pitch, but... I feel like we're in a good position to head into another season here on the OHL podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks to those who listened on these summer ones. I know we promised you a break from us, but these things kept popping up and we thought, especially with how well the OHL fared in the link, we better drop in for those that are still interested in the summer. But, uh, but yeah, I think we're, we're almost ready for the season. Mike, give us a like, give us a subscription, give us a review by all means, fire us off an email, OHL podcast at rogers.com. He's Dan Mahar. My name is Mike Farwell. A brand new season of the OHL podcast is less than 49 days away. Thanks for hanging out with us.